my name is Grant Major, and I'm the production designer on the film The Power of the Dog. Um, and I'm here in Los Angeles getting ready for the nominations for the Oscars at the moment. <laughs> So Jane and I did know each other before this film came along. I had worked with her 30 years ago on um, one of her early films and my first production design um, job actually called An Angel at My Table, 1990. Um, so uh, it was really, it was a great thrill to meet her again, actually. We hadn't seen each other over all this time. And um, you know, she, obviously her reputation is um, huge and it's a, it was a great thrill to meet up with her um, in, the, in those very early, early days. She brought with her a script that was very fully formed. So she uh, had been working on it for a long time. The adaption of the book, um, The Power of the Dog by Thomas Savage, which was written in 1967. 67? Uh, yeah, I think, I think I got that year right. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, she had, she's a particular sort of director that she, she very much lives the same way that she writes. You know, it's not as though she's outside of her comfort zone. She's, um, you know, she has a, a house kind of in the wilderness in um, the lower part of New Zealand, not very far from where we shot the film, actually. Um, she had a very thorough understanding of what she wanted from the characters, although the film hadn't been entirely cast at the time that, uh, that we met, um, she had uh, very strong opinions and she re really wanted to find out from me what my take on the script was for obvious reasons, you know, um, are we gonna be able to work together again after all this time? You know, um, she's very careful and very thorough about getting a great creative team around her. And we work very closely. There's not very many of us, you know, in the creative aspects of the of the formulation of the, of the film. You know, cards on the table. I've never been to Montana, unfortunately. I was I was very much like to go. Um, Jane and Tanya Sagatian, the um, uh, film's producer, and Benedict had all been to Montana, and uh, they brought with them a, a slew of photographs and things like that about what they liked and didn't like about it. Um, it's not as though they didn't like it. They, what they really found was that. Uh, Montana's moved on. I mean, it's a hundred year old story we're talking about here. The story's set in 1920s, 25. And, and um, so, you know, the buildings and the roads and the, you know, all these sorts of things, the fencing and just the way that cattle farming gets done has sort of moved on from that, that time. Um, the, also, you know, yes, yes, it's Montana and it needs to look like Montana and the people who live in Montana need to feel comfortable with what we were bringing to the screen for that. But it, more important than that was what was right for the film. You know, how, is it, how we needed a sense of place. You know, a really feeling of that the Burbank Ranch, which is all, all the drama happens, all the key drama happens on that ranch. It really had to feel like it had shape. It had, um, you know, a, a sense of sort of barrenness to it and this um, wilderness um, sort of prairie-like feeling to it. New Zealand's very good for these sorts of um, uh, unpopulated and undeveloped sort of countrysides. You know, we sort of certainly found it for the Lord of the Rings in its own sort of way. And uh, I've used uh, New Zealand for a lot of different um, parts of the world for the different stories and things like that that I've production designed. Um, we were very lucky to uh, find a, uh, a valley called the Ida Valley. Um, which is in the sort of middle lower South Island of New Zealand. That's al almost a place that times forgot, forgotten. You know, you could easily um, walk in there and feel that it's from the 1950s or the 40s and obviously the 1920s as well. So, you know, that we, we had that as a fabulous sort of location. The farm itself, the, um, the McKnight property that we used is a sheep and cattle farm. And um, for their own reasons, the owners of these properties don't like 
cattle being brought onto their property with the risk of disease and all that sort of stuff. So the McKnight uh, family were very, very helpful to us for um, using their cattle. They helped us wrangle the cattle and, uh, you know, um, they were very accommodating to us and the crew. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you could say it's like a, there's, a, there's a conceptual um, sort of storytelling thing. There's a poetical kind of thing about the the um, shapes of the landscape that we had and the sort of light that it has and things like that. And then there's the practical nature of actually being there, accommodating the crew around that, the, um, this very remote kind of part of the country. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, all the other practicalities of being able to build sets and find builders from around there and all those sorts of, all these sort of parts of the jigsaw puzzle come together for us. Yes, we spend a lot of time researching uh, time and place. Um, so I described, you know, uh, trying to find a, a sort of Montana-esque look to it. But, uh, you know, there's uh, some very, very good reference material from this time. Fortunately, photography was pretty well developed at that time. And um, there's actually an English settler who um, went, to, went to live in Montana called Evelyn Cameron. And she... Um, had the most dominant influence on the photography and the set design of uh, the Burbank Ranch and the life that we had there. Her uh, particular sort of idiosyncratic way of looking at uh, life. Um, she was recording it around the turn of the century, which I think is pretty close for us. The sort of um, reductionist kind of look to her um, framing uh, which was sort of isolates people, isolates animals and houses in particular on these big, broad Montana landscapes. Um, it had a, it's, it's just a very um, particular, uh, yeah, um, very it's almost almost stagey kind of look to things. You know, I very, very much like that because it, the isolation of the of the characters was very important because we're looking at these people under a microscope of sorts, you know, the, the, the way that the, their personalities evolve and, and sort of reveal themselves during the script sort of needed that sort of forensic look at them in, in, in some ways. Um, so likewise, you know, we had professional researchers who were looking at um, a, a, a broad range of, of um, resources for this. So um, Time Magazine actually did some very good studies of branding and the, um, in the in the west um one series in particular was sort of from the 50s and 60s really but um you know again it was sort of very much uh, it wouldn't have changed um from the 1920s so much so just these really wonderful um outdoor faces the the hands you know there's a very nice study of hands that we very much liked and and sort of pinned right up on the wall um it, there's different there's different to city faces there's different to indoor faces you know these people who spend their lives outside in the sun and the wind and the, the, the way that it sort of shapes their faces and, the, and all that sort of stuff was really, really good. And then, of course, there was all the detail about the all the fencing for the corrals and the just the farmyard um, stables and all that, you know, all those sorts of things. There's also, you know, we looked very closely at what mortuaries look like, of course, and what boarding houses look like. And cause all these things make a brief appearance in, in the, in the um, story. And, um, you know, like like all designers you know it's a matter of, sort of building up a library of images that we liked and um then just cherry picking the very best things out of them I, I can't remember how many pictures of barns that i accumulated there must have been in the hundreds or maybe even thousands and then um but barns in america change you know they're different from the east coast to the west coast and sort of uh, the north to the south so it's sort of finding a regional style and then finding the the, the best quality uh, details that I could find that sort of um, coalesce into what, what, what we ended up with. Oh yes, yes, of course, you know, the, this, um, the lighting, uh, the, the lighting sort of emotional states was um, planned right from a very early time, very meticulously. <clears throat> um, it must be said that the, um, the house did have electrical power but in the 1920s, in this remote location, it would likely have been a generator that's positioned on the farm somewhere, and it has a—it it wouldn't have provided the right sort of oomph, sort of the right 
uh, amount of power to really brightly light these interiors. And we very, very much wanted these dark, dark interiors um, because, you know, the, 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 the sets are very emotional places to me. They have a psychological personality to them that reflect the characters in the film. And that, and that by extension, the lighting is, helps to sort of bring that out. So the interior, the interior, the dark interiors were a sort of a dark on dark. You know, I like to think of them in some ways as a kind of like a Minotaur's cave in a way that, uh, you know, where Phil stalks around that place, um, uh, sort of haunts it all, almost, you know. And, and so we really wanted to bring out that sort of, um, yeah, that sort of uh, dark sort of man cave in a way. <laughs> but then that contrast, you know, with the outside, the light, the, the sort of brightness of the the exteriors and um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the location we had sort of in the, in the um, middle South Island, with the lowish light, but they have very big skies, they're huge skies. And, and uh, you know, they, they influenced, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the tone of the feeling of the outside of the ranch a lot. To the north of the uh, ranch is a series of mountains called the Hawkton Range. And in, um, in New Zealand, which is in the Southern Hemisphere, the, the, to the north, is, it gets the backlight. So, you know, they, 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 they work very well for us because we've got the side lighting in the morning on the Hawkton Range and the side lighting in the evening. And, and uh, so we planned a, a lot of our um, um, shots to be done in this particular light, lighting states that sort of brought out these, these um, lights and light and shadow. Um, you know, some areas, some interiors like the, the Red Mill were um, white interiors, you know, so this, the, the light against dark uh, and um, dark against light kind of thing was um, the sort of contrast, the contrast of these characters, uh, of these characters within these sets was to bring out the, the, the same sort of emotion, you know. Yeah, so, um, you know, again, going back to the original book, um, gave me a lot of ideas about the genesis of this, of this, the, um, of the house. So, you know, we could tell a life story in a way of the Burbank family through this, the, this one piece of architecture. Um, it was uh, um, brought out, as you probably read um, in, in other reviews, from the, um, the, the family, I should say, came out from the East Coast. So they bought the, the East Coast kind of design ideas and aspirations with them and built this grand house on the on the um on this big sort of open landscape um i think that uh time sun wind has sort of um paired back paired back that that um piece of architecture um and and given it a sort of a weather beaten patina much like the hands that we talked about before um the house was intended to be a social center uh for the Burbank parents and um, but it didn't work you know the, the, so, the social scene out there in the middle of the of the Montana ranching um, sort of uh, culture just wasn't what they expected um, uh, they also um, there's been a family eruption um, in the uh, in about 1900 about the time that Bronco Henry was around um, and you can feel that you know the, there's a there's a tension in their family you know the, the mother and father have left uh, George and Phil have remained they are continuing on with the cattle ranching but even George and Phil have got this quite strained relationship you know exacerbated by Phil Burbank's um, you know uh, fascination and um, just obsession with um, with Bronco Henry he's, and he's a he's like in a way the fifth character in this in the story, you know, he's there, but he's not there, you know, and, and uh, has a very powerful presence all the time. So, you know, the house now has become almost like a bachelor pad or, or like a student flat bachelor pad. It's, it's sort of been emptied of emotion, but it's, it's um, and emptied of a lot of its furniture. These cavernous spaces now, these dark cavernous spaces are at at atrophied um, somewhat, you know, since the parents left. And I think, you know, they just huddle around the fire in the winter time. And uh, I don't know if the, 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 the kitchen staff kind of can make much of a dent in that house. So it's sort of like, it's sort of, you're feeling like, almost like at the beginning of our story, things have, have really have um, sort of stuck like a log jam there. And um, 
So when uh, Rose is introduced to the place, it's not as though she can really make an effect on this place that's under Phil's thumb. You know, it's it, she she's sort of uh, she's from a different social strata. She's quite timid and and um, you know brings love into that space that has been eschewed of love. You know, it's 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 very difficult for someone like that to walk into a place with Phil there, who's um, got us, you know, doesn't want to change anything. It's a masculine, it's a very masculine place for him. But the th it's very interesting because like, to me, that's the family story. But the Phil story, he's separated himself from the family and he's represented with the barn. So the stables barn complex is like Phil, um, who's isolated himself and stands in front of that um, mountain range, um, standing squarely on the landscape. It's big boned, it's got these big, um, you know, timber structures that, that support that uh, are the skeleton of the, of the place. But it's also, it's, it's, it's an emotional heart for him, you know, and at the center of the heart, of course, is the shrine to Bronco Henry. And it has a sort of a tender side to him um, that we, that he's kind of walled off from the rest of the world. Um, you know, he makes, there he makes his little furniture pieces and the little, little delicate, um, objects that he gives to his brother Phil, uh, uh, his brother George, <clears throat> his, his blacksmithing shop and things like that. But, um, you know, there's a very poignant moment, I think, when when uh, the scene where Rose and Philip are trying to plant a garden, which you can tell is never going to work, <laughs> it's just going to die. But uh, Phil beckons uh, Peter into the barn and closes the door against Rose and it's bringing him into his uh phil's soul you know so it's a you know uh, I, I i think that the way the architecture and the the the, the architecture and the narrative have sort of um combined there into a very emotional beat to me is the is the the core of the production design of this you know it's um you can't separate them you know they're, they're not they're not look at me pieces of architecture they're not big sort of a grand gestures and things like that they are an emotional, an emotional integral part of that narrative storytelling, you know, to me. <laughs> Starting uh, a little closer to uh, the Burbank Ranch is a town called Beach. That's like the railhead where the cattle are, are um, herded to before they would be taken by train to Chicago. And, um, you know, a lot of that sort of uh, Midwest and the Northern part was just supplying this um, uh, beef trade to, to the big city there. Um, I like to see it as like a one horse town that's on the way to nowhere. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's just a dot on the map. And I, I'd like to think if we went back to it today, that would be a ghost town. It's, it's like a, it's, it's a um, town on the decline in a way. And um, Rose and Peter are marooned there. You know, they they are uh, they found their way there through their uh, through Rose's husband, who was a doctor, and um, um, he sort of abandoned them there by by um, killing himself. And um, yeah, so we built the uh, the red mill and the bar and the bar that you see. Uh, the, the rest of it, just uh, for your audience's sake, was um, put in by visual effects, other than the, the um, sorry, the uh, graveyard that we built as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, there's a particular kind of a style to these um, barren cowboy towns, if you like, that uh, is, is in America. And I didn't want it to feel like it's a, a cowboy town, you know, that you, Kind of see very often but i really wanted to make it feel real and we did put a lot of work into scrutinizing these period photographs and and just kind of dealing with the size of the town you know it, it, what it's it's there but it's not a it's not a town you'd sort of um host all lawyers and doctors and uh, there is a doctor but um you know all these other sort of um trades and things like that it really is just a railhead and and a, and a very very small place um, then moving on to Herndon, which is the town you reference as being the white town. I think that the, uh, it, it worked out very well for us that um, 
it was you know there's a, this light and dark black and white kind of um uh, one of the many things that, that that run through the story and it was actually a real uh place there's a place called oamaru which is a um a colonial town or at least it's a town that has a colonial part to it that's miraculously survived from um, over the last kind of 120 years in an unrestored state. And um, it's made out of the local limestone. And it was like a gift to me. I, I could, it could not be better for me because it had a particular um, flavor that fitted very well into the, the sort of starkness that we that we have going on for the ranch. You know, it's, a, it's that reductionist thing I mentioned before, you know, it's, um, it, it, it was, it was even though it had all this beautiful colonial detail to it, it was kind of quite simple in, in many ways. It has this quite you know, beautiful facade that we used and we didn't have to do very much to it. You know, we, we, we pared it back, took off all the modern elements from it and um, put the dirt on the streets and things like that. We, New Zealand's got no lack of period vehicles, you know, these cars. And, and it's a, you know, it is a beautiful time frame anyway, like the 1920s is sort of halfway between cowboy time horses and carts and, and wagons and things like this and vintage cars you know so it's, it's a very cool sort of combo uh yeah i mean it's a western but i mean what is a western you know we we think of kind of the cliche of western you know like gunslingers and and bar doors and you know, I don't know all these sorts of things but you know the west is a big place and it's taken place over a long period of time you know there's there would have been these sort of um the very first explorers into the west you know would be the sort of sharp end of things and it then it takes us through to the sort of latter end which we occupy and I don't think it's very fair to uh rely on cliches you know um the the the, the wonderful thing about this particular film is that it's got a very contemporary issues that it speaks of you know we spoke uh, I, I talked earlier on about about the um the sort of sexual politics that that jane brings to uh, her films and of course this one fits very well into that but it's also the toxic masculinity you talk about is a is a thing that we uh, see a lot of today and you know i don't want to go into sort of polit politics per se and the anthropological kind of nature of the world we live in today but it does speak a lot to that and the lid that we put on our um uh, uh the sort of the the beast that's inside of us the plant that's inside of us you know the thing that we sort of um shut away and and breaks out every now and again was, we did talk about that you know i i, I did um remember a, a, a very clearly a conversation i had with jane about what she, how she read the title the power of the dog of course it's based on the pa, on the psalm from the bible uh and which inter interestingly is a um a part of the psalm that describes the david and goliath struggle in fact um but uh you know this this sort of um we did talk a lot about this the, the spectrum of sexuality um you know when we're jane loves these conversations i gotta say you know we, we talked about all these sorts of things in the in the car while we were driving through the, the landscape looking for our location and um you know just trying to get our take on um the politics of the film which is very very potent um but you know the sort of the slow peeling back of of uh, phil burbank's character until we found you know behind this kind of rugged uh, 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 wall that he's built around himself about being a man, being more of a man than everybody else. And finally feeling that he did have a beating heart and that he did, um, you know, the sex scene, you could say, the scene that, that takes place between Peter and Phil at the end, which is really just to do with that, making that lariat and the, you know, the passing over the cigarette and things like that. Man, oh man, it's very, it was very, very strong. And, um, the, it's, the, it's the sort of climax of the film in, 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 in so many ways for me and, and the, the wonderful kind of um, betrayal that um, Peter gives to Phil, you know, puts on that knife in, in many ways with the, with the, um, the anthrax rope. So, you know, it's, it's redolent to me of all these very, very, very powerful themes, but yeah, it has a knock-on effect to today. And it's not just to do with sexual politics, it's to do with politics to me and to do with kind of um, 
you know, the, the way that people act outwardly um, uh, at odds with the complexities of the, the female, of the male, of the human psyche that we, that we have, you know. So yeah, that's my, that's my take on it. <laughs>